Good afternoon. My name is Yvette Cozier. I serve as the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Justice at the Boston University School of Public Health. On behalf of our school, welcome to today's public health conversation. These conversations are meant as spaces where we come together to discuss the ideas that shape a healthier world. Through a process of open discussion, debate, and the generative exchange of ideas, we aim to sharpen our approach to building such a world. Guided by our speakers, we work towards a deeper understanding of what matters most to the creation of healthy populations. Thank you for joining us for today's conversation. In particular, thank you to the Dean's Office and the communications team, without whose efforts these conversations would not take place. We are here today to discuss the landscape of reproductive health in the US. Together, we will talk about the range of services reproductive care encompasses. We will also discuss how public health can better navigate the politicization of reproductive health and better support equitable access to care. I look forward to engaging with our speakers and our audience for an informative and wide ranging conversation. I am now pleased to introduce today's moderator, Abigail Aiken. She is an associate professor at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. Her research focuses on unintended pregnancy, evidence-based obstetric practice, and the impacts of laws and policies restricting access to abortion, including how and why people self-manage their own abortions outside the formal healthcare setting. She is currently the PI on Project SANA, examining self-managed abortion in the United States. She frequently testifies on reproductive health issues and provided expert testimony to the Irish Parliament on the 2018 abortion referendum. She has consulted for the CDC, WHO, and UN on various reproductive policy issues. Abigail, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dean Cozier, for that very kind introduction. And it's my pleasure to be moderating today's discussion, which I really don't think could come um, at a more important time for all of us engaged in uh, public health, reproductive health, rights, and justice. So I would like now to introduce our speakers for the program today. We're extremely fortunate to hear um, from a range of um, experts in this field today. And first we will hear from Lee Hasselbacher, Research Assistant Professor and Faculty Director at the Center for Interdisciplinary Inquiry and Innovation in Sexual and Reproductive Health at the University of Chicago. Lee leads CI3's reproductive health policy research agenda, collecting data and translating research to inform policy debates and legislation. She collaborates with health providers, advocates, and UChicago researchers to achieve evidence-based policy reform. Next, we will turn to Whitney S. Rice, a Rollins Assistant Professor in the Department of Behavioral, Social, and Health Education Sciences at the Emory University Rollins School of Public Health and Director of the Center for Reproductive Health Research in the Southeast. Dr. Rice leverages training and transdisciplinary expertise from healthcare organization and policy, health ser services research, and maternal and child health disparities in the pursuit of greater equity in sexual and reproductive health outcomes, care delivery, and scholarship. Then we will hear from Diane L. Rowley. Dr. Rowley is Emeritus Professor of the Practice of Public Health in the Department of Maternal and Child Health at the UNC Gillings School of Global Public Health and a senior researcher at the Shep Center for Health Services Research. She has spent 30 years examining infant and pregnancy health disparities and is involved in conceptualizing health inequity and creating tools to evaluate institutional, equ institutional equity. Then we will turn to Jody Steinauer, the Philip D. Darney Distinguished Professor of Family Planning and Reproductive Health in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences based at the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. Dr. Steinauer is the director of the Bixby Center for Global Reproductive Health and the director of the Kenneth J. Ryan Residency Training Program in Family Planning. She focuses her research on family planning training, professional identity formation in medical learners, and the experiences of students and residents learning to provide patient-centered care. And finally, we will hear from Rebecca Valoria, an obstetrics and gynecology physician at Family Health. 
Dr. Faloria's areas of expertise include abnormal pap smears, transgender uh, and gynecolo gynecological sorry, gynecology and obstetrics, and contraceptive management. I'm so very pleased to welcome um, these esteemed panelists today, and I'd like to turn over to Lee Hasselbacher to begin. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. Let me just get my slides going here. Okay. Um, thanks again for that introduction and for this opportunity to join this incredible group of public health experts for this discussion. As Abigail noted, I'm at the University of Chicago, where I conduct research to understand the impact and implementation of reproductive health policy. I currently lead the team at CI3, an interdisciplinary research center originally founded by Boston University's incoming president, Dr. Melissa Gilliam. Our center's mission aims to address systemic and structural barriers that create disparities in sexual and reproductive health, with a particular focus on ensuring that all young people emerge into adulthood with agency over their bodies and futures. As we gather today to reflect on the future of reproductive health care in the U.S., it's worth noting that many of our projects with young people ask them to imagine what a truly healthy future would look like, both for them as individuals, but also for their communities. For example, our team has engaged young people in creative research methods such as speculative design and world building. Within these activities, participants are asked to build out a vision for a perhaps seemingly impossible future as a means of helping us reimagine pathways to achieving it. Given how dramatically the landscape of reproductive policy has changed in the last few years, many have suggested there's a similar need to reframe how we think about the future of reproductive health. Certainly some have been encouraging a radical reframing for many years, one that is informed by the principles of reproductive justice. This term first emerged as black women leaders met in Chicago in the 90s and argued for an approach to reproductive health and rights grounded in social justice and an emphasis on access. Sister Song, an organization founded to advance reproductive justice, defines it as the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, have children, not have children, and parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. In holding a vision of the future where this is true for all people, perhaps we can explore the steps needed to get us there. We can look around for examples in policy and practice that move us closer to this goal. In Illinois, where we focus much of our research at CI3, advocates have pushed for policies that reflect these goals. In 2019, legislators passed the Reproductive Health Act that established the fundamental right of individuals to make autonomous decisions about their reproductive health including both use and refusal of services. The law defines reproductive health care as care related to preventing pregnancy, ending a pregnancy, managing pregnancy loss, or improving maternal health and birth outcomes, and provides examples such as contraception, sterilization, preconception care, assisted reproduction, maternity care, abortion care, and counseling regarding reproductive health care. Defining these fundamental rights is critical, but they must also be accessible. Informed by the reproductive justice framework, we're also asked to consider whether all people have equitable access to these services and the social supports to build healthy families. Illinois has also taken important steps in this effort with policies that make it easier for pregnant people to qualify and enroll in Medicaid, make it easier for non-pregnant people to gain Medicaid coverage for family planning services, extend pregnancy-based Medicaid coverage for a full year postpartum, set up pathways to reimburse doulas and fund postpartum, postpartum home visitors, and require private insurers to cover the full spectrum of pregnancy and reproductive health care equally. Illinois has also extended Medicaid coverage for abortion since 2018, and we, along with colleagues at IBIS Reproductive Health, have researched the implementation and impact of this important policy change. We know from years of research that costs can be a difficult and sometimes insurmountable barrier to abortion access. We also know these barriers are experienced unevenly. For instance, the highest rates of poverty in the U.S. are experienced by women of color. While the Hyde Amendment imposes restrictions on Medicaid coverage for abortion at the federal level, states are able to extend this coverage with their own funds, a policy choice with significant implications given that 42% of births in the U.S. are covered by Medicaid. While we reported challenges in the initial rollout of Medicaid abortion coverage in Illinois, over time the program has become more established and streamlined, with eligible Illinois residents having access to immediate enrollment in Medicaid and their abortion costs fully covered. We have interviewed providers, patients, and analyzed clinic data over the last few years. Our findings suggest that when abortion is more affordable, access is more equitable. For example, we found that the number of people seeking abortion 
who reported having insurance grew significantly with the difference coming from public insurance coverage. And as the quotes on this slide suggest, abortion coverage also removed a significant financial barrier for patients with low incomes, with Medicaid insurance, or who were eligible for immediate enrollment. And in addition to ensuring access, we found that coverage enabled patients to choose their preferred abortion method, including sedation for procedures, without worrying about costs. And looking at the time before and after Medicaid abortion coverage, we saw the gap narrow between those with and without public insurance who received their abortion at or before 11 weeks. And this means that more people using public insurance had the option of choosing medication abortion. Furthermore, an analysis looking at patient zip code data showed that more patients from more socially disadvantaged areas received abortion services after implementation of Medicaid abortion coverage compared to before. And finally, we heard from clinics and other stakeholders that Medicaid coverage for abortion at reasonable rates has allowed clinics and abortion funds to leverage support more efficiently to cover costs for more people in need, a benefit that has proven even more valuable as more and more people travel to Illinois for abortion care post Dobbs. Over the, on the flip side, other examples emerging from our research demonstrate how reducing equitable access to abortion services can have broader health effects. Over the last year, our team at the University of Chicago has been conducting three separate studies to explore how abortion restrictions affect decisions young people and medical providers are making about where they want to live and build their careers. Preliminary findings suggest that young people are factoring in the reproductive health policies of states where they might attend college or move in the future to raise their own families. Medical students are considering where they will get appropriate medical training as a resident, where they want to build their career as a doctor, and where they themselves will get reproductive health care that they might need. Physicians are reporting high levels of moral distress as they must make decisions about if and how they can treat their patients, including those experiencing severe pregnancy complications, and seriously considering whether they must leave restrictive states to continue practicing medicine in the way they believe right. It's too early to tell what kind of impact these trends might have on the availability and quality of maternal health care in those areas of the country where health care providers have concerns. However, we do know that many of the states that restrict abortion access already have worse health outcomes and than states that protect access, and they often lack many of the expanded social programs that contribute to building healthy families. Given these concerns, we can see how continuing to reduce equitable access to reproductive care can have consequences for many aspects of health care. So as I conclude and reflect on how the public health community can take action with such a politicized environment, my hope is that public health experts and researchers working in other fields can see how their work is connected to reproductive health and justice, and recognize that the goals of reproductive health and well-being are shared ones. I hope we can continue to center the people affected by shifts in reproductive health policy, share their stories and experiences, collect evidence and data on health outcomes, and elevate proactive policies. And lastly, I think it can be helpful to take the time to imagine what it should like for all people to have health, healthy, happy, reproductive lives. Thank you. Thank you, Lee, for that wonderful presentation. Next, we will hear from Dr. Whitney Rice. Uh, Whitney, over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for being here. It's such a pleasure to share key findings from research that I and my colleagues at RISE have conducted relevant to health and social consequences that restrictive abortion policies and health equity implications of more equitable service access suggested by these findings. For anyone unfamiliar with RISE, the Center for Reproductive Health Research in the Southeast, I hope you'll become more familiar today. We're a center housed at Emory, comprised of people um, dedicating their professional and bringing their lived experience to informing social systems and policy change surrounding reproductive health rights and justice in this region. And we aim to do this through interrelated areas of focus, participatory research, research training and mentorship, and critical to reaching actors who affect change, research dissemination and communication. Since 2017, RISE has supported research studies in a number of areas, many of which are reflected in the categories and partnerships here. In a high-level summary, this work has sought to understand the effects that state reproductive health policies, including but also um, beyond abortion, have on health services use, health outcomes and inequities, health systems operations, and then also, highly importantly, 
what community grounded responses and solutions emerge in light of state policy climates in this region. And um, much of what I present today focuses on our abortion policy research. As many of you do not need reminding, the current abortion access reality in the Southeast is one where over half of states have total abortion bans, um, the rest near total bans or other gestational age limits, in addition to other uh, policies that uh, affect uh, the ability to provide care and, and receive um, or obtain um, an abortion. And this is contributing or has contributed to substantial change in abortion provision in clinical settings compared to before the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization Supreme Court decision that allowed more extreme patchwork of state abortion access. Abortion bans in many states across the country also correspond with closures of some abortion clinics, many of which are independent clinics that provide the majority of abortion care in the U.S. and offer, um, in some cases, the only free or low-cost access to reproductive health care in some communities. Uh, some clinics also notably offered usual sources of preventive health care. Considering this environment, uh, RISE teams uh, have studied restrictive abortion policy environment, even predating the STOPS decision, and have research underway to provide more current understanding. Findings from this work, uh, like that conducted in other settings, like we just um, heard um, out of um, Illinois, have research. Uh, so they suggest that restrictive abortion policies limit access to abortion, particularly for people already facing structural and intersectional inequities, especially by race, socioeconomic status, and age, as we've already heard. In a study that estimated the potential consequences of the current uh, Georgia policy limiting abortion access by gestation, uh, informed by the numbers of abortions provided by year over a prior multi-year span, our research estimated that Black people, people with lowest levels of education, and young people had obtained uh, a disproportionately lower proportion of abortions that would likely um, you know, not a uh, lower proportion of abortions um, that um, would, or had a higher proportion of abortions that would not meet the legal limit under Georgia's ban, for example. So we discuss findings from this work in conjunction with external research, suggesting that policy changes in the direction of increased access have alleviated inequity for some disproportionately affected groups. Shifting to the next set of key findings on the topic of healthcare provider constraints imposed, imposed by restrictive abortion policies, our team has conducted multiple studies in uh, settings to include Georgia, but also no, neighboring states that speak to how providers navigate the restrictive uh, and fluctuating abortion policy climate. So even prior to our current um, around six week ban, Georgia had a 22 week ban in place and there um, continue to be other restrictive laws, have been and continue to be other restrictive laws that require counseling and subsequent um, mandatory waiting period, parental notification, limit public funding of abortion among others. A RISE team looked at how providers perceived and experienced Georgia's prior gestational ban around 22 uh, weeks and interviewed um, providers inclusive of clinicians, staff, administrative leadership from four clinics. And in the study, providers reported strict adherence to the ban and shared effects on their care environment that included uh, additional labor, service delivery restrictions, legally constructed risks for providers, intrusion on the patient provider relationship among others. They also commonly reported mentioning disparities that they felt that they observed, um, that the ban was disproportionately affecting people of color, those experiencing financial insecurity, and those with underlying medical conditions. Nonetheless, providers described a clear unrelenting commitment to providing quality patient-centered care. And thus, 
These and other restrictive laws, as studies by our team and by others indicate, can adversely affect quality care domains such as efficiency, patient-centeredness, timeliness, and equity uh, of care provision. The existing research does document evidence of the potential for improvement in these quality of care domains with increasing uh, service access. And then in my last highlight on policy consequences, our team also explored birth outcome implications of shifting state abortion policy climates. Considering several of the potential pathways between abortion policy environments and infant health. So namely existing policy or existing evidence around um, policy pointed to the idea that restrictive environments increase likelihood of miswanted and uh, mistimed and unwanted pregnancies going to term. Research has demonstrated that pregnancy and childbirth carry higher likelihood of pregnancy-related morbidities and even mortality as compared to abortion. Um, uh, further, being unable to access wanted abortion care carries risk of uh, those pregnancy-related morbidities like eclampsia, hemorrhage, and mortality as seen in prior research. And then lastly, structurally deficient um, pregnancy and postpartum care environments characterized by inequities in insurance coverage, provider shortages, inability to access affordable care, and more also contribute to adverse birth outcomes. So for those reasons, um, we dove into exploring this relationship and findings revealed that Black individuals experienced increasing probability of preterm birth with additional exposure to restrictive abortion policies compared to non-Black individuals. Those with less than a college degree also experienced increasing probability of low birth weight um, compared to counterparts um, with additional exposure to restrictive abortion policies. And for all analyses, inequities worsened as state environments grew increasingly restrictive. So policies may contribute to rising rates of preterm birth and low birth weight, as well as inequities in them. Other research also suggests that greater state restrictiveness um, of the abortion policy environment is associated with infant mortality. And these studies collectively find that less mortality and, and inequity um, are observed in less restrictive environments. Now, shifting to additional comments on opportunities um, regarding equitable health service access, for sake of time, I'll more quickly highlight that our team has also contributed to the knowledge base around opportunities for service access that could alleviate or mitigate um, inequity or at least contribute to um, outcomes in that direction. And even in the presence of restrictive abortion policies um, and in other relevant contexts. So these studies include um, a uh, examination of, of facilitators of barriers to and benefits from equitable doula access, which notably includes full spectrum doula care, which can be provided for a range of sexual and reproductive health experiences, including abortion. This work includes research characterizing abortion funding support, a critical actor, and not just the payment for abortion procedures uh, for those procedures and or other, other um, methods of abortion for those who don't have access to needed resources, but also other costs like childcare, travel, and other logistical needs. We've been able to provide descriptions of abortion from caller and support characteristics over a multi-year span um, with our partner, Arc Southeast Fund, and um, this informed fund programming in subsequent years. Notably, some local government entities have included abortion fund support in their policy making and, and budgets. My last note is around opportunities to more accessibly provide reproductive health education. And in this climate where comprehensive sex education around abortion, um, ex sex education, including abortion has been restricted in some school and clinical settings in our region. 
future approaches necessitate innovative offerings, and our RISE team has had some opportunity to both develop and evaluate such educational tools. So I'm happy to say more about any of these topics in Q&A, and um, I want to acknowledge those who supported, developed, uh, and informed this work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Whitney, for that excellent presentation. And next, we are going to hear from Dr. Diane Rowley. Diane, uh, over to you. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Is this fine? So I'm on my phone because I am having internet problems. And so my slides will be handled by um, the host. And I can see if I can ask the host to get started. And I cannot see them at the moment. So I'm assuming that everything is okay. Do Shall I go ahead and start talking? Okay. That's good. Um, yeah, I can see it now. So that's actually not the first slide. I have a, there we go. Um, I have been working on issues of health equity for quite some time, starting with looking at um, factors risk factors and protective factors for infant mortality and maternal health, and then uh, expanding it to look much more clearly around what constitutes health equity. And so I'm gonna have a slightly different focus from the rest of the group. First, I want to acknowledge the current times that we're in. We have been encountering assaults on reproductive care and um, specific, you know, and we've heard this discussion already to some extent, but there are also, and then more recently, we've found out that the Alabama Supreme Court thinks that frozen embryos are children. And while we need to think about how this might influence the future of reproductive care in the U.S., um, we need to continue to focus on our work and what our visions are of what care should be. And so that's gonna be the nature of my few minutes that I have with you. May I have the next slide? Um, when we think about reproductive care, we, we focus a lot on reproductive rights, which is an individual's legal rights. And that's a lot of the issue around abortions and um, other opportunities to access care. But there also is this need to look at um, what the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences calls the condition of female and male reproductive systems during all of stages of life. This requires attention to a broad range of health conditions, not just abortion, birth control, and access to family planning and sex education, but um, a long list of conditions that require our attention. Some of those listed on the NIEHS website include endometriosis, uterine fibroid, adequate breast milk supply, erectile dysfunction, and sperm count. In addition to that, we've got this other um, area that's much broader, equitable health and equitable health care. And we have a vision in the US that is a commitment to developing equitable health. Simply put, health equity is the state in which everyone has a fair and just opportunity to attain the highest level of health. And many of us put this in the framework also of pursuing social justice. Next slide. So for the next few minutes, I want to focus on two frameworks that I think are important in constructing, constructing future reproductive care. 
that is comprehensive in scope and is equitable. And these frameworks are the life course framework that as envisioned by maternal and child health and the reproductive justice framework. You've heard a little bit already about the reproductive justice framework. And so um, I just will elaborate on that a little bit. We have the next slide, please. The life course framework as envisioned by maternal and child health defines the spectrum of factors that influence an individual's reproductive health through all stages of life. So we're talking about what happens during the preconception period when the individual is in the womb through the postmenopausal period. And it um, focuses on the experiences and exposures that influence health throughout that time. On the timing, the health pathways that are particularly affected during a uh, critical and sensitive periods as shown in the schematic. And on the environment, the broader community environment that strongly affects the capacity to be healthy. It focuses on equity in health, assuming that um, health reflects more than genetics and personal choice. And it focuses on protective and risk factors the interplay of risk and protective factors that influence health. So you've got um, this focus on what I would call biological, behavioral, social, economic, and environmental factors that contribute to health outcomes across a person's lifespan. And why is this important to reproductive health care? Because reproductive health needs to be dynamic over time. And the life, current life course approach allows us to consider the health needs and desires of people at each stage of life, including preconception care, pre-pregnancy care, pregnancy, infancy, childhood, adolescent, the reproductive years, and post-reproductive years. And I, I think it's important to use frameworks rather than just think about what clinical services we need or what interventions might be valuable at each of these stages, because frameworks can help policymakers synthesize and translate life course events and apply it to designing health services and delivery. And it allows us to extend beyond planning just for clinical services, it guides public health programs and interventions to focus on building environments that support healthy and equitable communities and ensuring that the broad array of protective and risk factors that are, are addressed in an integrated, coordinated, and comprehensive manner. May I have the next slide, please? So while the life course framework is based on research, um, the other important framework I think that needs to be used in thinking about the future of reproductive care is the reproductive justice framework, which you have heard was evolved from Black women's activities who attended the 1994 International Conference on Population and Development. This framework is based on human rights rather than the legal rights that um, are associated with issues around reproductive rights and, and um, abortion. And the framework is based on the need for social justice. You heard that it has three primary principles to, that should guide the development of reproductive health care in the US. They are the human right not to have a child, the human right to have a child, and the human right to parent children in safe and healthy environments. And as noted by Loretta Ross, who was one of the major architects of this framework, reproductive justice uses human rights frameworks to draw attention to and resist laws and public and corporate policies based on racial, 
gender and class prejudices. An important point I want to emphasize is the reproduct reproductive justice demands that the state not unduly interfere with reproductive decision making, but it also insists that the state has an obligation to help create the conditions for people to exercise their decisions with social support. It envisions a world in which supports exist for families of all configurations. It maintains that people should be able to have the number of children they want when they want in the way that they choose to have them. Furthermore, individuals should be able to raise their children with support systems that provide safety, health, and dignity. And when we think about these issues of safety, health, and dignity, it expands the area that is the focus of reproductive care because it means that we need to look at communities and how communities exist and how they can also be changed to provide safety, health, and dignity. We're talking not just about transportation, but the whole, but also education, broadly speaking, housing as well, uh, for example. And so it reflects what um, we think of as um, the activities where people live, work, play, and sleep, and are educated. And I, it's my feeling that, that the future of reproductive care should take this into consideration so that we are really um, primarily focusing on that aspect of providing care and services to, to people who are um, during, before and during and after their reproductive lives. So may I have the last slide, please? What's central to both the life course framework and the reproductive justice framework is the idea that healthcare extends far beyond what happens in clinical care. And that the future of reproductive care requires attention to the social context of people's lives. And it, I know that we are very concerned about policy now, but um, we also, need to be willing to think very much in the future about our role and how we can change policy and how we can influence um, I should, the uh, process by which policy is made. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Diane, for that wonderful presentation. And next, we'll be hearing from Dr. Jody Steinauer. So, Jody, over to you. Thank you. Let me just move my desktop around just a teeny bit. Thank you um, so much. Uh, I want to just appreciate Dr. Cozier, Dr. Aiken, the Boston University School of Public Health for holding this conversation and for inviting me to be part of this panel of amazing speakers. I want to begin my remarks by sharing a quote by an obstetrics and gynecology resident in Texas describing the moral distress she feels because she's not able to provide evidence-based patient-centered care. So in a study my team uh, and I conducted, she told us about a patient who presented with pre-viable, pre-turn rupture of membranes at 19 weeks, which is when the bag of water breaks. And at this gestation, it carries a high risk to the pregnant person, a very low chance of the pregnancy continuing to viability and a very, very low chance of neonatal survival. She told us how horrible it was to not be able to provide the patient the care she deserved. And even though the patient wanted an abortion, they were forced to wait until there was no longer a fetal heartbeat, until she became sick with an infection or with bleeding or hemorrhaging. Um, over a few days, the patient, in fact, did develop severe infection. She developed sepsis and was admitted to the intensive care unit. And then, and only then, was she finally able to have her labor induced. 
And I know that many of you have heard these stories. I mean, we've heard already from Lee and Dr. Rice today about these uh, experiences of moral distress. But when I when I read this quote, I want to encourage you to think about this learner who is forming her identity as an OBGYN physician um, and think about what it must be like as she's developing her skills in patient-centered care, communication, and really trying to uh, do what is right for patients. So she said, it was really hard. She was put in such danger because she's not allowed to make her own medical decisions and she easily could have died. So when she described her own experience of it, she said, it's hard to describe the words that I feel, the complete sense of inability to care for people. We do the bare minimum of what we're allowed to do, but we can't actually care for patients when they need it because we're not allowed to. It's just this complete sense of worthlessness. It's so hard. And so as we think about her, I wanna position her um, where she's training. She's in Texas. She's one of about 1,300 OBGYN residents who are currently training in states with the most extreme uh, bans, um, those uh, with the most extreme restrictions, those shown on this Guttmacher map um, in red. And in this map, I show you the number of residency programs in each state. And on average, a program has about uh, 20 residents um, in it. So in the next few minutes, I want to, um, I hope to convince you as you are engaging in this conversation and thinking about ways you can advocate. I, I hope to convince you to think not only about the patients currently having a horrible time accessing the care that they need, but also about the all the future patients um, who may be cared for by clinicians who um, are not prepared to provide the care they need either for abortion care or miscarriage care because those clinicians were trained in a state where they were unable to access the adequate, adequate training they need. Or I want you to think about, uh, or also I want you to think about the patients who may not even be able to access a clinician because clinicians decided to not practice in their community because of uh, these bans are really forcing them to violate their values. Um, and so I will talk a little bit about the workforce as well, as uh, Lee also mentioned earlier. So I want to just start by just saying medical schools, undergrad, what we call med undergraduate medical education must include abortion. The goal, after all, of medical school is to improve the health of all people by preparing physicians to meet the health needs of a country's population. And as we are discussing today, abortion is an important health need of our country's population. All physicians will interact with people seeking abortion care. All physicians must be able to counsel and refer, care for people after accessing abortion care, and uphold their professional obligations to values such as patient autonomy, confidentiality, putting the patient first, evidence-based medicine and patient-centered care. Also, medical school is about preparing physicians to consider what they would like to do in their future. And we know that physicians in many specialties, certainly not just OBGYN, provide abortion care. And I have this QR code along with this FIGO, our international ob specialty organization, to just point out that FIGO, along with two other worldwide organizations, have just made strong, a strong statement that all medical schools must include abortion worldwide. OBGYN is a bit of a unique specialty in medicine in that our accreditation council requires training. All ob programs must include training, and that's been in place since 1996. We have to not only be able to counsel and refer, but we really have to have the skills to safely empty the uterus, care for people with pregnancy loss, and it is our professional obligation uh, to provide abortion care, no matter what we personally feel about abortion in the setting of saving someone's life. So we really are obligated to train every OBGYN in abortion care. So abortion training is critical, and I don't have time to go into it, but it turns out that many studies have shown, both in family medicine and OBGYN, that abortion training also increases competence in many skills used beyond abortion care, for example, pregnancy loss care, or what we call miscarriage care. This is the journey of abortion training in the United States. The purple line is uh, considered routine training where it's completely integrated and expected in a program. The green line is uh, no training and this shows the proportion of programs over time. 
And you can see that in 1992, there was a nadir where only 12% of ob programs had routine training. Um, and actually, I'll pause and just say the, mid, the, the difference between these, the, the ones that are not routine or no training are programs with optional or opt-in training. But many studies have shown that routine training is better for many reasons. And of course, it's required by our accreditation council. So in 1992, only 12% of programs had routine training, and that's what inspired the ACGME, the requirement for training, and that also inspired Dr. Utalandi to found the Ryan program, which I now uh, get to direct. And what we do is we support ob programs to develop abortion care, develop relationships with clinics, and really um, integrate abortion training in their programs. And you can see since then, We've been steadily increasing over time. It also just shows you how hard it is and reminds us also that uh, there were many, many restrictions, uh, restrictive state laws before Dobbs, of course, and so many programs in many parts of the country have had a hard time for a long time training. So uh, in the last study, 72% of programs did have routine training and only 8% of programs had not available. So that was the pre-Dobbs uh, state. I want to also uh, go out way beyond OBGYN and just say family medicine, even though it's not required, it's definitely within the scope of practice. There's a sister program to the Rhine program called the Ready program to support family medicine training. There are many initiatives beyond family medicine and other primary care specialties, emergency medicine, et cetera. There are a few fellowships for people once they're done with residency. Uh, complex family planning and maternal fetal medicine in ob and also uh, some fellowships in family medicine. And then, of course, physicians are not the only part of the workforce. We have many different disciplines that need to have integrated abortion training way beyond medicine. To give you a scope, a sense of the numbers of programs, I've put these two uh, maps side by side from two different publications. So they're a little different and we're in different points of time. Each dot is the residency program. So on the left, you see ob programs. On the right, you see family medicine programs. And um, the green states at the time of, that these papers were published represented yeah. states that had you know, worse or severe restrictions. And um, you can see that uh, there are more. The main point of this is I want to show you that there are a lot more family medicine programs than ob programs. Um, and just to give you a scale, so there are about uh, 1,300 ob residents, of course, as I mentioned before, training in the banned states, and there are 4,000 family medicine residents being trained in those states. And if I then put medical schools and nursing schools on a map, it would be shocking to you how many people. Um, there are about 30,000 medical students training in states with bans. And at least from my back of the envelope calculation, I'm guessing there are at least 60,000 nursing students. So this is a huge group of people who are at risk of not learning the core skills they need to be able to provide this care for patients. Um, we, uh, Lee, I believe, already mentioned workforce concerns. And just to give you a snapshot of applications to residency um, stratified by the level of the ban. On the left, this is a publication from the American Association of Medical Colleges. This is the percent difference in applications to OBGYN compared to the previous year. And on the right, it's the percent difference in applications to family medicine. So you can see that overall there was a significant drop in the medical, the number of medical students who wanted to go into these two specialties, which may very well be because partially at least because of abortion bans and concerns about not being able to provide comprehensive reproductive health care. But you can see that the many fewer, twice as many fewer uh, applied to abortion ban programs in abortion ban states for both groups. So this is very concerning and also adds to the concerns about the number of uh, clinicians who we worry will leave the state after training. Um, so not only are we worried about applications, we're worried about people leaving. And as it's already been mentioned, we're very much worried that many of these states already have significant, um, significantly higher uh, morbidity and mortality associated with pregnancy care, uh, large disparities in care by patient race and ethnicity, um, and uh, so when you overlie being forced to continue pregnancies along with fewer clinicians who are there to provide them, we are facing a significant uh, public health crisis. 
quickly to uh, to try to, to to try to uplift uplift you a little bit on this. I wanted to tell you some of the things we're working on to improve training. So one thing a lot of groups are trying to do is to develop really comprehensive standardized curricula that we could just require for everyone. There's a national collaboration. Uh, with Innovating Education and Reproductive Health, along with the organization that oversees residency training in OBGYN and the Ryan program to create an online curriculum on the Innovating Education site. Um, and then there's a lot of work to develop simulations in areas, both procedural simulations and uh, communication simulations to prepare the workforce to be able to provide care with fewer uh, direct patient clinical experiences. Um, and I was excited to hear Dr. Rice's um, description of the Emory online materials. I want to also uh, offer this website to you all because it's an amazing open source uh, uh, resource for you to learn all about abortion care and other topics. Um, the last training strategy I want to highlight is out of straight travel. So we've been actively working working very hard to try to match programs in restrictive states with programs in un less restrictive states for residents to travel for training. Right now, there are 17 very strong partnerships that exist, actually 16, um, with a few more on the way. And you can see each arrow represents a program that is sending their residents to these different states. And I can tell you more about it if you want to hear about it, but this is a very challenging process. It takes uh, six to nine months to establish the partnership with all of the hoops people have to jump through. Um, but it is very exciting and successful and more than 100 residents have traveled and it's um, overall beginning to meet the needs. Although I'll just remind you that there are 59 programs in these states and we've only solved the problem for 16. Finally, I mentioned moral distress right at the beginning. We're really seeing impacts on learners and we're doing a lot of work to help mitigate this. And I just wanted to close with an uplifting quote. People have talked about how hard people are working to do the right thing for patients. And in our study, this was a um, quote by a resident from South Carolina. Um, she said, I feel like I'm willing to jump through hoops to help patients get the care that they deserve because I feel so, I believe so deeply in their right to have that care. And we've heard that from all of the residents in our study and in our programs across the country. So I hope that you'll all demand that health professions learners are trained in abortion care, that you'll collaborate across disciplines to make sure that this happens and to think really creatively about it. I hope you'll support organizations that support training and include, I want you to hold the workforce and training issues in your advocacy because I very much worry that this will be a long-term ripple effect of these bans. Even if the bans were successful in removing them, we, we will have potentially a large group of health professions, uh, health, health professionals that can't provide the care that they should be able to provide. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, I wanted to highlight on the top right, we have the Ryan Program and in Innovating Education. I included their web links. These two, Medical Students for Choice um, is an organization I've been involved with for a long time. American Medical Students Association are doing inc incredible work. Nurses for Sexual and Reproductive Health has incredible training programs for nurses. And then the three down here are all primary care and family medicine-based programs that have incredible training materials available. And reach out if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jody, for such an excellent presentation. And finally, we're going to hear from Dr. Rebecca Valoria. So Rebecca, I'd like to invite you to conclude our speaker lineup today. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Let me just share my screen. Hopefully you can see everything wonderful. Um, so my name is Rebecca Valoria. I'm a OBGYN who does 100% clinical practice. So I am hoping that I will provide another perspective in discussing the future of reproductive care. It's wonderful to be here with everyone because I think this collaboration with both the public health, the social health, the other physicians is really how we're going to move forward. So um, I have noticed I have one disclosure that I'm a content advisor for Walters Core. So again, to define what reproductive health, and this is a definition from the um, WHO, it is a state of complete um, physical and mental and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity, and it 
It's all matters that are related to the reproductive system and its functions and processes. And I put this here because reproductive health is a lot. And I think in the um, environment that we are now, it is incredibly important to see that it's not just abortion, but it is seeing the whole person as themselves. So where I am in Boston, I do have to acknowledge that I've been practicing for 20 years in a state that has unrestricted access to abortion, contraception, gender affirming care, um, fertility care. Um, and so it is hard for me. I realize that I am so lucky and grateful, um, but I also understand how delicate of a balance is with the other residents that I've trained with who are in states that are incredibly restrictive. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge that most of the history of obstetrics and gynecology in the U.S. really comes on the experiences of enslaved persons who had, um, who participated without consent in um, a lot of the learning um, about how our bodies work. So in my clinical practice, I do see reproductive health um, with three really major pillars. And I will add that the CDC adds this additional pillar, which I think everyone has talked about, is infant and family health. Um, where I practice, we have primary care physicians and family medicine physicians, and they really are helping with the infant health, infant health aspect as well, but it is very much part of the reproductive health um, view, okay? So reproduction, and when I say reproduction, we're talking about the ability to either not have a child or have a child during your reproductive years. But then also I add menopause because you're gonna see in my next couple of slides why I do think talking about um, healthcare beyond just reproduction is gonna be important. We also talk about sexual health in terms of, again, if um, the rise in STDs is all in specifically syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia is really important because that affects our general health as well and also again contributes to infant health. And then finally, what I just say wellness. So this is where asking about sexual orientation and gender identification is really, really important in everybody's life. Um, and then talking about organ inventory. And if you look at my little, this picture, we both get PAPS is that we do part of our training as physicians is not making assumptions about what part, body parts we have, what we use, um, and choices about fertility or not getting pregnant. And then again, um, part of the workforce and family planning and family medicine is thinking about immunizations, our mental health and our social health. And that picture I put as both get paps is a reminder that we are seeing a change in gender identity and identity treating patients that may not present as female, but yet they have organs in which when they're used um, could result in pregnancy, whether that's desired or not desired. Um, and I do put this slide in here to remember that gender diverse populations are similar and that they have not been, um, that while they are a very small part of the population in most studies, um, in the US it's about 0.5%, but in my health center, we see about 17% of patients who are um, in the LGBTQ population, but also because I would say this is a population that is very much underrepresented in any type of research or any type of statistics, because we're not asking gender identity, um, and it's maybe missing a population. But it does come under, and I would say most in the past probably 10 years, um, it is incredibly relevant because patients who may not identify as female um, or may not be female presenting, but are assigned female at birth, um, who are choosing gender affirming hormone therapy, um, it is really important that we talk about fertility. And that transgender, and again, that is an umbrella term, just um, to say that your gender identity does not match with the assigned um, sex at birth, um, that retained gonads may engage in sexual activity that results in pregnancy and that estrogen or testosterone, which are gender affirming hormone therapies are not reliable forms of contraception. And again, like I said, there are, um, besides racial and ethnic disparities, this group of transgender and gender diverse individuals we have seen in literature just recently that yes, there are extreme barriers to accessing um, reproductive healthcare. 
And so there are two points that I want to go over that kind of shake my, shape my view as how we approach reproductive care um, in the future. And one of these is this population projections um, from 2020 to 2060, which was the 2000, based on the 2020 census. And there are three good points to keep in mind that 2030 is a demographic turning point. At that point, one in five people will be over the age of 65. Women, older women will continue to um, outnumber older men, although that gap is uh, becoming more narrow, that the population will continue to grow, but it's going to grow, but it's going to be driven by immigration um, influx. And then that our population by 2030 is going to be much more racially and ethnically diverse. Dr. Valoria, and so I just didn't want to cut you off. Um, it's we can see your kind of the side of the screen. Uh, just wanted to flag it in case you'd like to go into presenter. Perfect. No, thank you so much. I apologize for that. So when I looked at that, I thought, all right, how does that affect OBGYN, which is um, you see this expanding fertility longevity. And that means people are going to be able to get pregnant for a little bit longer through um, uh, assisted reproductive therapy. Our older population of women, we're going to start engaging in conversations, talking about how your body works and how um, to feel comfortable about it in menopause. And then these last three are kind of my own ideas is that I do think as our population changes, we must, must, must include these, um, look at the more racial, include racial um, statistics in there about the changing population. Anyone who has children or teenagers, we know that social media is really, really part of the daily lives. I do think social media education and outreach um, in a multicultural way is going to also be part of reproductive care and how we receive it. And then definitely increased use of artificial intelligence to prove for data gathering, telehealth innovations that will improve outcomes for a lot of the diverse population. So this is the second thing I want us to think about, about shaping the future of um, reproductive care. And this is, again, from the maternal mortality rates in the U.S., which everything, everyone, I think, has pretty much alluded to, is that in 2021, we did see that maternal mortality increased dramatically. So from 2019, you went from about 21 maternal deaths per 100 live births to 32.9. Um, and that is staggering. And the majority of these have been through postpartum complications that could have been prevented. The other really, really important part is that the maternal death rate um, among Black Americans is much higher than uh, other racial groups. Um, and so there's a lot that is probably driving, one, the increase in maternal mortality, both age, chronic disease, but also probably pre-existing health disparities and um, access. And this is where I would say, we got to be looking at what can we do in the future to help decrease this. Oops. So where are we at now? So this is just a kind of a quick slide with approximate numbers. I'm sure everyone can um, probably be more specific in that. And we're looking at where we can change um, the reproductive outcomes, you know, or improve them. And I think there are three areas. So contraceptive access, um, abortion, and then fertility. Um, so about two thirds of women are using contraception right now. While we do have unintended pregnancies, they are decreasing. About one in five pregnancies are will end in abortion, with the majority of those abortions being um, from uh, African American or Black Americans, then followed by white women, then non-Hispanic. The majority of abortions are not just um, procedural, um, but they are medication, meaning someone takes a medication um, and the the pregnancy can pass. And then talking about the, the right to have a family or build a family, um, and we will get into what recently happened in Alabama, is that 2.3% of um, infants are born through assisted reproductive technology. And right now there are at least 400,000, some people in some um, studies, it says a million frozen embryos in the US. The majority of those being um, formed simply for fertility preservation. Um, and male factor. So where do we go from here? Um, I think increasing contraceptive access is a good starting point. And that means um, allowing, having funding for persons who want it, um, giving 
through social media or even in school that we have age appropriate, medically accurate, comprehensive sex education available to everyone, that we have over the counter options, which by the end of this month, we should all be celebrating that there is a um, progesterone only over the counter uh, birth control pill that is will be available. Um, looking in and advocating as providers about emergency contraception. And then of course, always research, research, research. And then I did want to say with the emerging contraception that there's a lot of hope um, and that the 50% of persons who are or in our population who are sperm producing and contribute to a pregnancy, there is hope for future male contraception. So either in a daily pill or gel, but more excitingly, there's a reversible on-demand pill that um, is a pill that someone would, a male-bodied person would take right before having sex. It inhibits um, a certain enzyme that helps sperm move um, and makes them immobile um, and will provide about 24 hours of contraception. There's also a lot of emerging contraception that is using immunocontraception. So non-hormonal, which is a big plus for a lot of persons um, in which there are antibodies to sperm or um, certain proteins on the sperm that would render sperm immobile um, as well. And that would be in the form of like a vaginal gel. And then finally, one aspect, when, again, when we talk about reproductive health, what does it encompass is STD prevention. And so there's a lot of good contraception um, research going on that involves both contraception, but also incorporating antiretrovirals to help decrease the risk of STDs, um, which would be wonderful. Again, as we see STDs increasing like syphilis and that which increases congenital syphilis in infants, this would be a great option as well. Um, and then abortion, I do think is obviously we've all been talking about it. We all know about the Dobbs versus Jackson and what has happened since then. Um, and we count as a national organi organization, I think it's through um, this, uh, the Society of Family Planning, I think Dr. Um, knows about this. So this is what I got recently it was um, a publication that was just out or a news release in February that since April 2022, so about 15 months since um, the Dobbs versus Jackson, the abortion volume has been consistent. However, the 14 states with abortion bans have been drastically, um, have a drastic decrease. And you've seen a large increase in abortion in Il Illinois, Florida, and California, and that telehealth abortions. So you have a remote telehealth consult and then medication is mailed to you, represented about 16% of um, abortions as well. And again, looking about the uh, maternal mortality that has increased, I wanted to include this um, to say that legal induced abortion is markedly safer than childbirth with a risk similar to outpatient dental procedures. And so whether it is a procedure abortion so um, or a medical abortion, it is still um, markedly safer than childbirth. Um, and then finally, just talking about what's happened in Alabama in um, February, basically the Alabama Supreme Court has defined um, a embryo, which is literally a six to 10 cell um, entity as an extra uterine unborn child. And that in this case, they defined that um, the wrongful death of a minor act applies to all unborn children, regardless of their location. Um, and so subsequently, so much of IVF or um, in vitro fertilization using preformed embryos has stopped in Alabama. Alabama. And the um, Society for Reproductive Medicine condemns this profoundly misguided and dangerous court decision um, in that they see three major things happening. So modern fertility care is unavailable for the people of Alabama. Um, again, um, what we talked about by Dr. Steinauer's young physicians will choose not to come to Alabama for training or to even begin their practice, which then gives you a deficit of um, well-trained OBGYN providers in Alabama. Um, and then existing clinics 
um, will be forced to choose between providing suboptimal patient care or shutting their doors. And I would say that when you look at who's using um, assisted reproductive technology, a lot of it is for embryo fertility preservation. So either egg or um, egg preservation or embryo um, preservation. So using an egg immediately fertilizing it and then using those embryos. And the majority of IVF is um, used by white women. Um, but remember that parent persons who have a uterus who want to single parent or in, uh, patients who are in the same sex who use a surrogate, um, those are also patients who are utilizing IVF. And so the future of IVF very much in um, the in a limbo state, especially if Alabama's restrictive um, laws then go to other states um, and it will limit very much um, who is able to family build. It will also increase the risk of building a family or increase the cost, I apologize, um, of fertility care in general. And then finally, um, one thing that Dr. Steinhauer also talked about is that the post-ops providing training will, is going to change dramatically. And that 44% of OBGYN residents um, are currently in states that have very restrictive um, abortion um, rules. And that even though um, it looks like applicants, just like you said, either decreased or have decreased in states that are restricted, um, remember that our workforce in general of all specialties in medicine is that nearly half of all residents, regardless if they're in, uh, in OBGYN, are women right now in this world. So not only are they trying to help um, provide care, but these um, women are also going to be subjected to some of these restrictive um, rules. So just in closing, what I see as the clinical future of reproductive care is I do think that there will be friendly states that are going to um, provide the majority of abortion care, assisted rep reproductive technology, gender affirming care, and as well as high risk obstetrics. I think the population changes in the next couple of years are going to result in an aging population of um, female bodied people, um, which will change kind of the scope and spectrum of reproductive care. I am very hopeful that there will be other forms of birth control available to us um, that will be reasonable. And then finally, I do think research is going to start um, including looking at very specific populations and the diversity and how healthcare can be um, improved, healthcare outcomes can be improved through social media and artificial intelligence. So um, I am happy to take any questions and I appreciate everyone's attention. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for that insightful presentation. And I'd like to thank all of our speakers uh, for being with us, for giving their time and for these really excellent and information packed uh, presentations this afternoon. So across our presentations, we've heard about the future of reproductive care in the U.S. from the policy impact perspective, the life course and social determinants perspective, the clinical provider perspective, and the patient perspective. And really, I think our speakers have given us so much to think about. And I'd like now to open up some discussion in the about 13 minutes that we have left. And I'd like to ask all speakers, if they could, to join me um, on camera so that we can turn now to our Q&A part of the event. Now, in the interest of time, I'll ask one question as the moderator to all of our panelists, and then I'll turn it over to the audience Q&A because I see we already have um, several very interesting questions there. I'd like to be able to address many of those. So let's just start off with uh, one question um, in an overarching sense um, for our panelists. And, you know, I think we've heard in the presentations um, that at times improving equity in reproductive health care can feel like a really big, if not insurmountable challenge. And so I'm wondering what for you is one thing we could do now in your area of policy research, training, clinical practice or expertise that could improve reproductive health care here in the U.S. or at least set us on the right path when we look at the current uh, policy limitations that we have um, in so many different states. So that's a question for everybody. Um, and uh, I just invite our panelists to uh, go ahead and share any thoughts they might have on that. Uh, 
I don't mind taking a stab at this um, because I think my perspective is very much a public health perspective as opposed to primarily clinical services or um, medical services. And so my first reaction to this was um, we need to take care of the children that are being born by providing good care for them um, and responding to this idea that a child um, or childhood begins in, in with an embryo, who's taking care of those kids who um, would not have been born if there weren't restrictions in abortion? So that's the other part of this scenario that we haven't addressed, but I see it as part of providing adequate reproductive care as well. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Anybody else want to chime in? I'll add just one thing that comes to mind is to um, that everyone can do is donate to abortion funds. I think they're doing a lot of the work right now to make sure that people have access. And I know, for example, the Chicago Abortion Fund also provides care for folks if they're being evicted from their homes, lots of other wraparound services. So that's an easy thing that anybody can do right now. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Great comments. I guess my addition is about, um, I think there is an opportunity for folks to be aware of what the reality is in their state context. Um, and I think that awareness has the ability to contribute to, um, you know, I think there are a lot of assumptions and uh, research has shown some, um, you know, misinformation about that that policy realities and so I feel like that information um, is you know powerful and can be um, engaged folks can engage in conversation within their professional communities um, and other communities about um, what the current context is and I think it also has a role in um, some abortion stigma reduction as well as it relates to abortion. Of course, I think this is a broader reproductive health um, conversation, but I think there is a tendency to, to like um, sort of minimize and or um, uh, leave that part out of conversation. So I'm glad to see um, just how much we've been <laughs> saying abortion here today. Yes, certainly. Anybody else before we move to audience Q&A? Please. Oh. I'll add to Dr. Rice's comment. I feel like um, everyone can hold their uh, health professionals in your community accountable for providing the best care possible, uh, keeping patients' experiences confidential, not reporting people to law, law enforcement who obtained access to medication abortion, for example, uh, via web access, um, provide post-abortion care for people, um, and can, even long before Dobbs, we knew that uh, Gynecologists, primary care providers, hospitals did not actually provide to the extent that the laws allowed because of stigma. And so I feel like many places now still, thank God, still have exceptions, even in these abort abortion ban states. And so we really need to hold the hospitals and the providers accountable for taking care of all the people who can access legal abortion in their state so that we're not taking people out of state who have medical problems, pregnancy complications, et cetera. Uh, so that's what I would say is talk to your local clinicians, find out what's happening. Great. Thank you. Actually, so many practical and actionable um, responses there. Um, thank you, everybody. I'd like to turn to our audience Q&A just to make sure that we address some of the very interesting questions. Uh, thanks, audience members, for putting these into the Q&A function. Um, and the first question I have here is how can we appeal to our population of the U.S. who believe that abortion contraception is, uh, for example, biblically 
forbidden without infringing or threatening their religious freedoms. I find one of the toughest battles in the countrywide debate is including and finding ways to speak with these folks. So does anyone in this conversation have any thoughts, advice, suggestions for tackling this conversation as public health professionals since we are so active usually in the sphere of public health education? I can try one attempt at responding to that. I think there has been a dominance uh, of conversation at the intersection of like religion and reproductive justice that takes sort of that approach or, or kind of like it's a, a, a loud part of the conversation, but there's also a lot of religious um, groups, experts, organizations that um, really, uh, uh, center um, in this conversation, um, you know, reproductive autonomy and, and reproductive freedom as um, part of their, what they see as um, entwined within their um, religious values about, you know, just what people should be able to um, experience <laughs> in terms of their, you know, well-being, um, that they see that as tied to their faith. And so there are um, I can try and um, drop a few organizations in the chat that I am aware of that kind of, um, you know, s center that in their work. And so I think um, perhaps their call to action is just like not allow, not continuing to perpetuate that as the loudest narrative as around, um, you know, kind of religion and reproductive health. That is a part of it to be sure, to be clear, but um, certainly not all perspectives. I can also add on based on some of our research with um, religious hospitals and religious health settings um, that I think that you can also talk about a distinction between individual held beliefs and then whether those beliefs should apply to health systems, to entire states, to entire communities. And I um, I know it's a, it's a tough needle to thread, but I think recognizing that, you know, and honoring people's individual beliefs, but having conversations about whether those beliefs should govern access within institutions and within policy is, is one way to talk about it. I, I'll, I'll just add that um, I've done some work in um, this program called Effective Conversations. It's, it's mostly been geared toward training clinicians to talk about abortion, but um, some principles from that are just to not be afraid to talk about it, and to um, we the one way you can change people's opinions and make people more open and compassionate is by communication. Very few people are actually on the polar ends of this discussion. Many people have conflicting feelings and a lot of emotional feelings about abortion. And one important principle is if you have a journey story to share it. So especially for people who are coming to this from a faith based lens of having concerns about abortion, people who have their who do have a faith and have decided within their faith that abortion should be available and act, to, to share that experience, especially if someone has grappled with it. So it turns out sharing your story, your own journey is really helpful because people can really relate to you and can, it, it messes with their mental template a little bit of like, oh, this person is of this faith identity and went through this and shared some of the concerns that I have and has come to a different conclusion than I have. So I encourage people to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I was just going to move to the next, but if there's another comment, I can wait. Okay, so the next question I wanted to put to the panel, um, what strategies could the community help establish in our communities that in our communities that are experiencing maternal deserts. So where we look across the US and maternal deserts and the idea of that has been mentioned, uh, are there strategies that the community could help establish um, locally to, to help combat some of that? Can you, um, when you say maternal desert, do you mean uh, provider deficit for maternal care? Yes, uh, okay. like. 
Sorry. Um, so I do think, again, this is probably my own personal opinion, but I do think a lot of um, telehealth has been available in medicine where, um, where there may be low resources, um, but there is kind of a, a hub where someone is available 24 seven to say, um, all right, I'm seeing this strip. Like it's basically telehealth labor and delivery. You know, so while in the middle of I don't, like uh, rural Massachusetts, you know, there is someone in Boston who is covering multiple um, labor and deliveries in these rural places that can have access to um, the monitoring, knows what each hospital capacity and resources are. And that is your kind of backup to say, it's time to transfer this person to a tertiary care. And so I do have some, I know of several um things that are being set up, you can almost kind of think of it is in terms of like there are ICU um, providers who sit kind of again in a hub and they monitor ICUs in rural parts of the US who don't have resources. And they are kind of the backup to say, it's time to transfer or you don't have enough um, blood products or anything like that. And so I do think this intercommunication of telehealth and again, AI and electronic medical records and everything is able to at least help a low resource place transfer to higher resources to prevent maternal deaths um, and infant deaths. One other quick note as, as our team has been engaged in and I've seen a lot of research around like sort of community rooted providers, the potential to support a broader range of providers in this climate, um, whether they be doulas, whether they be um, community midwives, um, there's just a history of um, their ability to um, you know, reach um, communities in a really community rooted and reverent way. So I'll just add that as a as a supplement to the telehealth options. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists. We are now at time, uh, but thank you to the audience for joining us, uh, to our panelists for so generously giving their time, uh, and to um, Dean Cozier and uh, Boston University School of Public Health for hosting this wonderful event today. I'm so glad to have been a part of it. And I'll now pass back to Dean Cozier to uh, conclude the event. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all. I, I really want to thank our moderator, Professor Aiken and our wonderful panelists for such a rich conversation. And importantly, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us and engaging in today's program. I wish everyone a good afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>